Hello everyone and welcome to this quick Unity tutorial where we are going to discuss how to place buildings with a grid-based system. By the end of this video we'll have a simple grid placement scheme that allows us to select a building type in the UI, point at a spot on the map and round this hit position to clamp it to the nearest cell. We'll even have a nice grid display to help us visualize these cells in the scene. To do all of this, we'll start from the previous building placement system we prepared in this tutorial and we'll just adapt it slightly to introduce this grid clamping. We'll see that just by implementing a few extra chunks of logic, we can very easily convert this previous code into a building grid placer. So if you're curious to get a detailed explanation of the core features of our building placement system as it is for now, feel free to have a look at this previous tutorial. But of course, if you want to get the code and the assets from either the previous tutorial or this one, don't forget that you can also check out my GitHub Unity repo over here. And with all that said, let's dive in and see how to transform our free building placement system into a grid-based one. Just before we get to our grid placement system, let's first do a quick review of our current free placement scheme and of how we'll have to update it to fit our needs here. If you just want to get the assets ready for today's grid-based placer, once again, you can go get them on the GitHub and skip this part. But if you want a condensed summary of how the system works and a few little modifications required to reuse it into this tutorial, stick around. Okay, so in the previous tutorials, we prepared two scripts. The building placer and the building manager. The second script, the building manager, is put on all of our building prefabs and so we have one per building instance in the scene. It's the script that takes care of updating the building placement mode and its visuals so that we always know if the current target spot is valid or invalid or if the building is fixed. The building placer, on the other hand, is instantiated just once in the entire scene and it's a global system manager. Its role is to respond to the UI button callbacks and then keep a reference to the type of building to place and to the current phantom previsualization instance of said building type. This phantom building can turn green or red depending on the obstacles on the way, thanks to its own building manager instance, and once we click, it's fixed on the ground at the position we're currently pointing at. We can also do a right click to cancel the build, press shift while clicking to chain multiple builds, or press the spacebar to rotate or preview in our building. In this tutorial, the point will be to create a new version of the building placer script that does a similar logic for a grid-based placement system. More precisely, our new script, the building grid placer, will inherit from the previous building placer script and simply override some of its functions. So in order to get access to all the class properties and methods that we want, we'll need to slightly modify our building placer script and turn some of the private objects in it into protected ones. We'll change all the private properties at the top and the prepare building function at the bottom. Because we want to override our prepare building function later on in the tutorial, we also need to mark it as virtual. This way, it will still retain its current logic but we'll be able to add more when needed to extend its behavior. The rest can stay as is since we don't need to change anything in the logic of the cell building prefab method and we'll copy paste the update to be able to easily do modifications in various places in our grid placer. Now, as we've said in the intro, if you want to check that your building placer script is up to date for today's tutorial or if you want to copy it directly in your project, you can check out the GitHub. But now, with those updates finished, time to jump into our grid-based placement system. Alright, with all this in place, let's create our new building grid placer script and have it inherit the previous building placer. We'll start by copying back the update method of the parent script. It will be easier than overriding since we need to sprinkle modifications in a few places. Indeed, what we want to do first is change the way we place our phantom building to follow the mouse. Instead of just using the ground hit point directly, we want to snap it to the nearest grid cell. 
So let's define a new float variable in our class called cell size and a function called clamp to nearest that returns the clamped vector 3 position based on a threshold. We'll use it in our update inside our Raycast logic to snap the hit point to the grid by passing in the hit point and the cell size value. In this clamp function, we'll use a common snapping algorithm which has us multiply, floor, and redivide our value so as to get a clamped version of the initial vector. Also, to make sure that our buildings are in the middle of the cells and not actually on the lines of the grid, we need to make sure that we offset our position by half the size of the cells on the x and the z axis. And while we're at it, let's also add a little extra feature, which is an optional grid offset. We'll define it as a vector2 parameter in our class and add it to our clamps position in the clamps to nearest function. This way, if you want your grid to be a bit shifted compared to the world coordinates, you can easily reposition it in the scene with this grid offset value. Now, if we set our cell size in the inspector to something like 10 and run our game, we see that we are already done for the main part. If we select a building and move our mouse on the ground, the phantom preview follows the cursor but with discrete steps, by snapping to the grid we set up. But of course, it's a bit hard to predict at the moment where exactly the building will jump to as we move the mouse, because we can't really see this grid. So to wrap up this quick tutorial, let's add an extra object to visualize our grid cells. In order to visualize our placement grid, we can again readapt a previous asset that we made in this tutorial on a procedural grid URP shader. Back then, we made a simple shader and material to create a tweakable grid on the XZ horizontal plane with a customizable cell size, grid thickness, and colors for the grid lines and the background. In our case, we don't need as many options since we only want to show the lines. So we can copy the shader graph asset into a new one and only keep the left part of the logic that computes the grid mask. We'll use this mask in the alpha slot and we'll just drag in the grid color parameter in our graph and connect it to the base color output. If you want to recreate it from scratch to better understand the details, feel free to have a look at the tutorial. Or else, just don't forget to enable the alpha clipping option in your graph settings so that you get the alpha output and you can connect the grid mask to it. Also, just for style, let's change the grid color parameter a bit and set its type to HDR to have some additional intensity value. This will allow us to add some bloom and make the grid glow, which is always a nice way to integrate this kind of non diegetic artificial elements in a 3D scene. Okay, so if we create a new plane and apply a material that uses our placement grid shader on it, we see that we get a black grid that is half in the ground. To avoid having these rendering issues, let's just give it a tiny offset on the vertical y-axis to have it be a little above the ground. We also have to be careful to remove the collider on this grid plane object, otherwise it will collide with our placement raycast and it will block our mouse when we try to place a building. Also, you see that the cells are quite small. That's because, for now, of course, this grid doesn't depend at all on the grid cell size that we defined in our built-in grid placer. We're gonna have to link this visualization to our data by updating our shader's parameter from the C-sharp script. To do this, the first step is to create a reference to our grid renderer in the building grid placer class and drag our plane object to it in the inspector slot. Then, to actually update the grid render parameters, we're going to create two new private methods in our class, enable grid visual and update grid visual. The first function will simply turn the grid visualizer on or off depending on the input boolean flag to show or hide the object. The second function will access the material of the renderer and set its cell size parameter to the right value based on the cell size property inside our building grid placer class. To know what the exact name of the parameter to update is, we can go to our shader graph asset, open the node settings panel, and select our cell size parameter. Then the string value that we need to take is the one in the reference input. 
Notes that Unity only allows us to set a vector 4, so we'll basically ignore the last two components and set only the X and Y components of the vector at cell size. Similar to what we did in the last Unity tutorial on how to make a URP cross-platform wireframe shader, we'll also use the onValidate hook to force a refresh of the grid visualizer whenever we update our manager object in the editor. So now if we come back to the scene and change the cell size value in our building grid placer component, we see that the grid visualizer auto resizes to match this new value. We can of course change the grid thickness and its color a bit to get something more suited for the scene. Then to actually benefit from our HDR mode, let's do a few things to add a bit of glow to this grid. First, we'll set the color to something with a higher intensity. Then we'll add a new empty game object in our scene and we'll give it a volume component. Then we'll click on this button to create a new volume profile asset and in this profile asset, we'll add a new bloom post-processing effect. We'll toggle on the intensity and push the slider up to actually trigger the effect. And finally, we'll make sure that the camera in our scene has the post-processing option enabled and to also preview the results in our scene view, we'll click on this button to enable the post-processing in this view. Last but not least, let's make sure that we show and hide this grid at the right time. In our script, we're gonna say that we update and hide our grid when the game first starts, that we also hide the grid if we cancel the build or we place our object without chaining a new build, but that conversely, we show the grid whenever we prepare a new phantom building. For this last part, we need to ensure that we first call the logic from our parent class in the prepare building method, thanks to the base keyword, and that only then we add our own logic to hide the grid. At that point, if we restart the scene, we see that as soon as we click on the button in the UI, we select a building type and the grid appears, and then we can move our phantom preview around while snapping it to the grid to choose a spot. If we click to place it, then the grid disappears. We can of course still use our different tools, like cancelling the build, rotating the building, or chaining multiple builds. And we see that the grid toggles on and off when need be to help us anticipate the future placement of our building. And on that note, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial and that you learned a few things to create a grid-based placement system in Unity and C If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, if you have other ideas of Unity tricks that you'd like to learn, don't hesitate to leave a comment. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.